Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Coonan. I am co-chair of the WHO hosted Social Participation Technical Network, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion. I'm joining you from Sydney, Australia, and welcome wherever you are in the world. We're here today to take a deep dive into the recently launched Handbook for Social Participation for Universal Health Coverage, developed within the Health Systems Governance Cluster at WHO under the guidance of the Social Participation Technical Network, or SPTN as we call it. The SPTN is comprised in equal parts of civil society, academia, and technical, par uh, and technical partners, uh, as well as government representatives. And the handbook responds to a recommendation of the report of the WHO task team on WHO civil society engagement uh, for WHO to specifically emphasize and promote civil society participation in policy processes and to provide guidance for member states to do so. And the motivation for the development of this handbook lies in the realization that to reach UHC, we not need not just technical knowledge and not just political will, critical as both of those are, but also social involvement. Communities, civil society and populations need to play a central role in the movement towards UHC to ensure that no one is left behind and because they play a critical role as service providers and in holding governments accountable. And so the question this handbook sets out to answer is how to do this, how to best include civil society, communities, and populations in national health planning processes. We hope you'll join us in this discussion. So please use the Q&A section of the HSR platform to ask questions, which our panelists and speakers will respond to later in the session. You're also very welcome to use the discussion forum too to talk to each other, though we won't be taking questions from there. We're gonna get right into the discussion, but before we do, we have a very special message from Tunisian Nobel Prize, Peace Prize laureate, Madame Wided Bouchamawi. So let's hear first from Madame Bouchamawi now. Thanks, let's play the video. Mother, but it cannot be. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to deeply thank the World Health Organization for the honor to be a speaker and a guest. The COVID-19 pandemic and the social distancing measures oblige us to be far from each other, but it cannot prevent us from gathering even if it's virtually. Today, our theme is social dialogue. And it's not difficult to understand why I'm speaking in front of you. After the Tunisian revolution, when our country was falling apart, four civil societies, including the Tunisian Confederation of Trade, Industry and Handicraft, which I had the honor to chair, decided to act together in a so-called last chance attempt. We, therefore, had to create a dialogue, an authentic dialogue between two completely opposed parties. To move forward in the discussion with the constant aim of finding a solution together. This experience was above all, a collective initiative in which each protagonist acted with patriotism, using common sense and putting aside his ego for the supreme interest of his or her country, we had to give Tunisian men and women new hope and reassure them that they are developing democracy for which they had already paid a heavy tribute would continue. I'm truly convinced that dialogue builds relationships because it gets people actively involved. 
It needs engagement. An engagement that sows the seeds of trust over time. It's not manipulative and is not put on for the sake of an unspoken motive. It's honest and draws on what is best in us. As Karl Popper, the social and political thinker, wrote, the value of a dialogue depends to a good extent on the diversity of competing opinions. In fact, people involved in a dialogue know that they do not know the truth. They do not identify with any stance. Their intention is not to convince each other of anything. They are together because they are deeply interested in examining an issue in life and coming to a deeper understanding because of it. Engaging in a democratic process where a social participation builds tolerance and pluralism is the target of a dialogue. It's not teaching an unanimous consensus among the people involved, nor convincing them that one's idea or opinions are absolutely correct or irrefutable. It's rather sharing one's perspective and lived experiences with one another about difficult issues. The main point is not judging or making decisions, but understanding and learning from our differences. Dialogue promotes exchange of information and proposals in order to achieve a common goal. It's essential to the decision-making process and to achieving the sustainable development goals. Dialogue creates real human connection and then strongly, strongly contributes to most sustainable societies for a secure future. In a majority of countries, social dialogues has declined, but much evidence proves to us that more effective dia social dialogue could help reduce inequalities, enhance the equivalences and performance of labor markets, and help countries achieve their co commitments under, under the 2030 agenda. At this time of the global COVID-19 crisis, the need of partnership between all parts involved is crucial. Social dialogue is not easy and often takes much effort and time. However, it's also an investment bringing substantial benefits to all. I will conclude with a quote by Mr. Andrew Ackland to think about. If you think dialogue is expensive, try conflict. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for that. We're really honored to have the support of Madame Bouchamawi. I'd now like to hand over to Deepa Rajan, a health systems advisor at WHO headquarters. Uh, Deepa has led the development of the handbook and is going to provide a very swift overview of its contents before we deep dive into a couple of the, the key topics. So over to you, Deepa. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I will um, go into what we spent 
pretty much two years on, um, together with the whole range of experts and, and civil society um, participants. And that's the Handbook on Social Participation for Universal Health Coverage, which we launched in December, just before the holidays. You see the link on your screen. You don't have to um, memorize and write down all those uh, letters and numbers at the end. Uh, in the, the discussion forum, you will also see the link and that will provide you the uh, non-downloadable conference copy of the handbook. It is uh, a conference copy only at this stage, which is why it's not downloadable, but the final version uh, will be going up very soon on the WHO website. Next slide. So just to give you an overview of the handbook concept. Um, so this, as Justin said, it started off as, uh, and the impulse really came from the WHO Civil Society Commission, which gave a number of recommendations. And one was that WHO needed to give more specific and uh, guidance um, to member states in order to uh, guide them and um, orient them in the how of participation. So our target audience here, you'll see our member state governments, so they're policymakers. And this um, this decision actually was subject to great debate. So we had in our external advisory group, the Social Participation Technical Network, as Justin mentioned, the SPTN, we did um, have uh, an in-depth discussion on whether they really should be the target audience and why not civil society. And the reason why we did go for member state governments is one very loud voice, one uh, loud um, uh, statement that came from several voices actually, especially from civil society, was that, that there was already and there exists already enough um, and sufficient or quite a bit of uh, documentation and guidance by civil society for civil society uh, when it comes to engaging more meaningfully and being more effective in engagement. However, the gap in the niche is really at the um, policymaker, decision maker level. And as WHO, of course, this is one of our key mandates. So our target audience are, is policymakers. And we looked at several types of engagement modalities, um, direct engagement modalities with people, with the population, via community engagement mechanisms. And we distinguished this from the population modality because in health, as we know, especially in a lot of the vertical, more vertical and life course specific programs, community engagement mechanisms has been a, a modus operandi, a way of working for several decades where lots of expertise exists and lots of good results have come out of it. So we wanted to ex examine and look at those mechanisms as well. And directly with populations, what we mean by that is also the lay citizen, maybe the unaffected parties and engaging with those groups as well. And then of course, we have the engagement modality via civil society. Now the three are not mutually exclusive. So the separation is a bit artificial. We recognize that. So this is why we have that overlapping space. But in practice, really, it means, uh, you know, there is a, a, you know, the the same people might be sitting in in all three types of groups but it this distinction really helped us ensure a comprehensiveness in the um, primary and secondary data analysis and then what is our context so for what why are we engaging uh, why do we want meaningful engagement and the overarching context is really the push for universal health coverage we want countries to advance towards UHC. We know that one of the missing pieces in that puzzle is governance. We know that, you know, the financing and service delivery aspects have gotten quite a bit of attention and funding and rightly so, but we also need to strengthen governance and participatory governance. So those decisions that are being made around UHC related topics tend to happen mainly at the national level. So, the, so we're looking at policy dialogue processes at national level, national health planning. In some settings, it might be at subnational level, of course, but this is um, the general uh, context. Next slide. So I'll skip over this because uh, Justin already mentioned the Social Participation Technical Network. Uh, this is our external advisory group. Then next slide. And um, this is what we spent the best part of two years working on. So we did uh, primary data analysis, which is, uh, we went to nine different countries. We collected primary data on various topics um, linked to social participation. Again, making sure we covered the different modalities, different types of topics within the UHC space and different um, country uh, income 
types, high income, low income, middle income, and different regions. We also did literature reviews. Um, so that was our secondary data analysis. We did about eight of them. And then we had um, a lot of uh, really good and vibrant interactions, which are external and internal advisory group. The internal being mainly the community engagement experts from the disease specific and life course specific programs. Next slide. And we also had a four month civil society consultation at the beginning of this year, which was um, very insightful. And most of the feedback that we got was really open ended, um, you know, prose feedback, which really helped um, fine tune some of the handbook's key messages. Next slide. So this is the outline of the handbook. I invite you to really click on that link that Kira has put into the discussion forum and really peruse through the handbook. Um, we really, we work through, besides the introduction, of course, we look at an enabling environment for participation, which is really about the, the fundamental premise of this handbook, that um, participation is about trying as much as possible to level out power relations and imbalances within a participatory space to foster meaningful participation. And we go into the sort of the nitty gritty details of that in that chapter. And then we go into much more practical topics. And one, the next uh, chapter three is something that Kira will be going into in depth after this presentation, which is about representation. It's about how to select representatives, what kind of criteria should we be looking at, how to lend legitimacy to take on a representative role um, to the various participants because and to make sure that they represent who and what they're supposed to represent. Then we have a chapter on capacities and the necessary capacities, not only for the capacities needed on the population, community and civil society side, but more importantly, on the government side, because that's where we see, you know, we, we do see some capacity gaps and where there it's um, governments do struggle in this how of participation. Then on chapter five, that's, uh, I will be going, uh, doing a bit of a deep dive into that chapter after Kira where we look at the policy uptake of the results of a participatory process and see how that can be improved. And then we have two further chapters, which we won't be going into um, in, within the remit of this session, but it's on legal frameworks for participation and then ensuring uh, participatory engagement that it's sustained over, over time, over um, uh, in you know into the future because we know that most participation is largely voluntary so this is really an issue for those countries who are serious about setting up and institutionalizing participatory engagement mechanisms but all of these are in that link um, you know the full handbook so please take a look and um, and thanks very much I'll end there thanks Deepa uh, really terrific over you uh, Deepa, do you want to uh, hand over to our next speakers? Yes, I think I will take on that role <laughs> then, since I see that Deepa was on mute, and I would like to also welcome everyone from my side. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. My name is Kira Koch. I'm working in the Health Systems Governance and Financing Department, and I've also been uh, part of the team of putting together this handbook on social participation for universal health coverage. In the next couple of minutes, I would like to provide you with key insights on one of the two topical chapters we present today, and that's representation and participation, chapter three of our book. Next slide, please. Representatives or the perceived lack of representatives of those who contribute is one of the most oft-cited concerns of stakeholders in setting up or institutionalizing social participation efforts. The issue of representation is closely linked to legitimacy and credibility. The widely held notion being that if those who are part of a participatory process are representative of whom they are supposed to represent, often the public, then they are also considered legitimate. More importantly, the results of the participatory process are then also seen as legitimate and are more likely to be taken up for policy decision making. 
Interestingly, though, in practice, representativeness is often not explicitly reflected on in many participatory processes, yet it remains very present in both the participation literature and the primary data collected for this handbook. The chapter thus aims to provoke policymakers to reflect on two central issues. The first one, selecting participants. A well-reflected selection process can bring in participants' diversity based on criteria which are adapted to the policy question at hand. Defining that policy question is key and should always be the starting point to subsequently think through the roles of participants and why their feedback should be thought. The second point is on format and design, which can lend legitimacy and credibility to participants. Here, we focus on the representation role of individual participants for them to meaningfully contribute on an equal level as possible. Next slide, please. Throughout the various case studies, we note, however, challenges in finding the right representatives who not only be considered legitimate, but also have the skill set to represent the public, a constituency, an idea, or their own individual experience. Policymakers clearly struggle with the issues and they don't really have a clear formula for assessing representativeness, which leads us to the conceptualization of representation first. Representation is acting on behalf of someone, which means making them effectively present via vicarious intermediary because of the reality that not everybody can be invited. This is, however, not an easy task, and we need to acknowledge certain challenges up front. The first one is related to power imbalances. In the handbook, as Deepa mentioned in the beginning, it, the focus is on government-led participatory spaces, where it is imperative to acknowledge that the starting point of any such participatory space is imbalance in terms of power and influence. One source of power is legitimacy a participant may have or be perceived to have. Some stakeholders may have their expertise or government position to legitimize their presence and contribution in a participatory space. However, for lay participants and civil society, it is different. They often depend on representation of a group, a community, an idea as their primary source of legitimacy and thereby equal to power and influence. Being transparent, therefore, is extremely important and being explicit about representation is important. Who is being represented? Who is the target audience and why? To provide the legitimacy to all participants at the table. The second point has to do with laity or the uniqueness of lay uh, or civil society contribution as distinct from expert professional or government cadres. There's a certain appeal that we would like to consult the ordinary woman or man. In reality, this person doesn't exist. We have to acknowledge that the most that most people are not representative of a public in and of themselves, and no one person or even a group of people can necessarily represent the full spectrum of the public. In addition, the mere act of participation itself means a person becomes less lay as he or she gains experience and can build confidence and skills. The boundaries are therefore fluid between lay, experiential expertise, and professional technical expertise, especially due to the increasing prof professionalization of civil society. The last point I'd like to make refers to the various methods that exist and in pros and cons. We find that qualitative representation is more relevant for health sector population engagement mechanisms. Statistical or quantitative representation of the full population is um, administratively cost, uh, complex and costly. And it also does not mirror the population adequately in terms of characteristics relevant to health systems performance, such as gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, but also health needs and health systems experience. In general, the literature and case studies insinuate that participant selection processes focusing on qualitative representation tend to be more successful in bringing in diverse voices. 
especially in light of the key underlying principle of UHC, this is very much important to leave no one behind. Quantitative representation is still useful in specific situations, especially when combined within a mixed method approach with selection criteria aimed at qualitative representation. In the next slide, please, great. In the next slide, you will see an overview of the key issues to reflect on when selecting representatives. First, the selection process needs careful attention and reflection. As mentioned before, the starting point in designing any participatory process needs to be a clear objective and rational to enable a selection process that matches that. And this means to ask ourselves the question who the public is. The public in reality is a blend of different mini publics in society. The literature offers three broad categories. In practice, of course, these are, these are blurry, but it still helps us to get an understanding of the different groups to select participants. The first one is pure or the lay public. They are unfamiliar with the issue of discussion and can provide an unbiased or unaffected view. The second one is the affected public. Here we have, for example, consumers, service users, patients, or maybe depending on the question, it can also be caregivers, family members or community members living in a certain location. They are determined by the policy question and can provide that experiential knowledge. And the last one is the partisan public, the most complicated group and the most heterogeneous. Here we have interest groups, advocates, non-governmental organizations. They may be better funded or better organized than the other two publics. Hence, they may have a more dominant voice uh, than the others. This might be acceptable or not. It heavily depends, as mentioned before, on the policy question again. The point here is really to think through the different publics we have, their potential conflict of interest and where power relations are and how best to mitigate them to cr create that level playing field to have a constructive and meaningful discussion within the participatory space. And then we have different aspects to look into, which I don't go too much into details, but for example, the dependency on volunteering participation. Um, there's always an additional need to reach out to marginalized groups, independent how mature the system is. We constantly need to ask ourselves what can be done to get input from and understand the views of those who are not participating. And then, of course, it is advisable to use different techniques in order to have the most advantage and understanding the views and perspectives of the different parties involved. In my last slide, please, um, I'm referring to the design and format of the participatory process, which can influence as well the ability of participants to effectively engage in a representative way during the deliberations. For example, here aspects which are important, again, is transparency and clearly formulating roles that provides participants the legitimacy to be at the table and justify their participation. Preparing participants with balanced factual information, ensuring a safe space for representatives to express themselves freely. The, here, for example, we may need to think about the meeting location. In some certain situation, it might be more advisable to do a focus group of homogeneous people who feel more comfortable to speak up the paramount importance of competent facilitation, of course. And then one last point is parity of constituency groups or participation rotation. Too few civil society seats for such institution elicit concerns of just ticking the box um, and participants face criticisms of uh, lack of representatives. When the balance, however, is tipped too strongly towards civil society representation, an insufficient link to decision makers and policy making may be the result. There is clearly no magic number, no ideal percentage split in terms of the, of the balance between the different types of representatives. What I would like to mention here is that it is really important that all the points that have been mentioned above need to be carefully thought through to ensure that all participants are regarded as legitimate 
and can meaningfully contribute to the deliberation. I will leave it here uh, at this point, and I would like to hand over the floor to Mahmoud, who is an expert in social participation and will provide us with a reflection on how the Thai case, one of the most sophisticated models, is ensuring meaningful representation in the National Health Assembly in Thailand. Nanut, the floor is yours, and thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Katya. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the WHO uh, to invite me to present Thailand's experience on social participation, particularly on the issue of representation. Um, I will start with a dominant concept that contributes to social participation in Thailand and has been applied in many health organizations, the, health, the triangle that moves the mountain. We believe that to tackle any problems, especially complex or structural problems, it requires a synergy of three powers, knowledge power that generate evidence to inform the policy makers and the public. Social power to mobilize the whole of society and political power to set policies or laws. This concept is applied to project program and even to governance body structure. For example, a board of the National Health Security Office, which operates universal coverage scheme, and a commission of the National Health Commission Office, which support a participatory process of developing public policy. Today, I will deep dive to the National Health Commission and the National Health Assembly, which is the governance body and the platform beyond health. The agenda and stakeholders are broad spectrum. Representative of the commission and the assembly decode the concept of the triangle that moves the mountain. Look at the assembly first. The constituency consists of government sector, academia sector, and people sector, as shown on the slide. Each constituency selects their representative to participate the one-year process of the assembly by themselves. And the role of the representative is not only to speak on behalf of the constituency, but to convey what agreement and commitment at the assembly to the constituency. It is a two-way communication. Furthermore, the representative should ensure that the agreement, in this case, the resolution is implemented by the constituency. The resolution, which is adopted at the assembly is submitted to the National Health Commission. The commission is chaired by the prime minister and has members from three sectors equally. People sector is one third of the members. One of the re reasons to have people sector at the commission is to secure voice of population and bring information from the ground to the national commission. Uh, next slide, please. The National Health Commission and the Assembly both are under the National Health in 2007. So we have been working on social participation for 13 years, and this has not counted several years we had worked before the act. Anyway, whatever how many years we have worked, there are rooms to be improved, especially on the issue of representation. Our big challenge is to get the right representative to the assembly, because we are not the one who select them. Representation is not about quantity, but quality. The three qualities that we need most are, one, know about your constituencies, meaning that know the problems, the concerns, and the proposal of your constituency. Know more than your constituency, meaning that know the process, the content, the goal of the consultation. The representative should secure benefit of the constituency. At the same time, compromise for benefit of all. Keep in mind that we, don't, we do everything for a country, not for a constituency. Lastly, 
a representative should be equity minded. In each constituency, there is a voiceless group. The representatives should find the missing voice in your constituency and speak on behalf of them too. For the lessons learned, there are four lessons if I may offer to you. One, practice makes it perfect. And to keep practicing it, social participation should be institutionalized. National Health Assembly organizes every year because of the National Health Act, for example. Two, Invest in representative capacities. I suggest we should build capacity for all sectors according to the triangle that moves the mountain, not either of them because they interact each other. Furthermore, this is not only capacity, attitude is matter too. Three, analyze ecosystem of policy sectors or policy issue. This will help you find new constituencies. Otherwise, you will work with the same old idea for years. Things will not be changed. Lastly, walk the talk. As I mentioned earlier about the role of representative, they don't just speak on behalf of the constituency and request other constituency to do. They have to bring back the agreement and, and commitment to the constituency and implement it. This way will make the representative legitimated and credited by all constituency. That's all from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nanut. Uh, I'm sure uh, people have things to say and questions to ask, and I'd encourage all participants to put your questions in the Q&A section of the platform, and we'll come back to them soon. But right now, let's uh, hand back to Deepa, to talk about one of the other topics in the handbook, and that is how you actually get from engagement to policy change to decision making. So over to you, Deepa. Thank you, Justin, and thanks, uh, Nanut, for this sort of uh, a bit of the practical within within this theoretical. So I'm I'm going to walk you all through now to through chapter five of this um, handbook where we look at policy uptake and um, how, you know, what are the factors that help increase it. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I have organized this uh, very brief presentation into the, the key findings of the in primary and secondary data analysis that we did. So first I want to start out with the problem statement and then we'll go into the, the those factors those that tip the balance to more rather than less participation uh, results being taken up into decision making. And then we will just touch upon very briefly on format and design and capacity aspects because of time constraints. But again, more details on those aspects can be found in the chapter, which you have in the link uh, sent through the discussion forum. So next slide. So firstly, I think it's important to say that publish, public participation initiatives have insufficient influence on decision making, unfortunately. So in the literature, what we often hear is uh, what's often cited or the term used is the deliberation to policy gap. And basically it, that underlines the, that, the fact that participation input and decision making are not automatically linked. And also little guidance and documentation really exists on that subject. And um, there's poor alignment, unfortunately, but between deliberative processes, um, you know, in and of themselves and um, and policy making. And in we, we see a lot of literature actually on the part process of participatory governance mechanisms, but it's a bit of a black box of what happens when the process is over. And so that how that input is used and analyzed is really fairly unclear. And so we relied quite heavily on our case studies on the primary data to look specifically at that aspect because what we got out of the literature was was fairly unsatisfactory. And um, one thing that's clear though, is that policy uptake is not always the priority in participatory governance processes. And um, a lot of scholars and practitioners advance quite a value driven argument that participation is and should be a value in and of itself, an intrinsic goal. 
And, um, and it goes back to this idea that people who are affected by a policy should have their say in that policy and it, they have to, they should have their say to lend process leg legitimacy to the policy and, you know, to empower citizens along the way. So then the question, of course, that we have to ask is that if policy uptake is not the principal ob uh, objective, then what is? And there's little consensus really on that answer, because if you look at the public participation effectiveness studies, they all use differing assessment endpoints. And sometimes the endpoints are really what we would call sort of softer endpoints, looking really at trust, which of course now in the COVID context is a, is a huge issue um, and, and can be an endpoint in and of itself. Um, increased understanding for um, other, for opposing viewpoints and many other goals can be linked to public participation initiatives. So this is very differently defined across the social science community, across practitioners. Um, and sometimes the, the, you know, how effective it is, is really linked to process related outputs rather than policy decisions. And this might be also a reflection of the fact that, you know, policy uptake is quite a, you know, in some contexts and with some topics, it can be a very grand goal. So that might be a, a longer term goal, but in between there are other smaller objectives that need to be achieved along the way and, and a particular participatory process or an event may be more aligned to one of these um, more proximate objectives and intermediate goals. Um, next slide. So when we looked at, okay, what, you know, if in those um, examples that we were able to find and study and had the fortune, you know, the good fortune to study and where we did see increased and more policy uptake, what we tried to tease out were the factors that really tipped the balance to more uptake into decisions. And so firstly, and this is not going to be a huge um, surprise to any of you is that a culture of participation really increases the likelihood of public participation input translated in, into policy. Now, um, what does that mean though, in, concretely? So basically it's, it's about an institutional culture which embraces innovation, which is, and because that kind of culture is more open to the change which comes about when listening, when really listening to others and taking their views into account, which is the next step from listening. And so support from senior management to make those policy changes based on the inputs of a participatory process is really a reflection of that organizational culture. And, and we know that such a culture doesn't happen overnight, but it's cultivated by increased exposure to participatory processes. So the more the chance that we have, the more interaction there is between people who are different from you, people who have opposing views, people who come from a different background, um, does seem to lead to um, a change in attitude in the sense that it, it becomes at least more favorable, not necessarily to a decision that is opposed to your views, but to a decision that comes out of a participatory process, which in the end is usually a compromise style decision. So this is of course something that happens fairly slowly over time so that so making sure you have multiple opportunities to interact, to engage, to agree and disagree, and to listen to and understand other viewpoints is important for developing that mutual respect and understanding, which um, basically means we need long-term commitment to participate, participate, participation. So a single one-off event, while in and of itself can be, can be a good thing to do, if you really want to instill a modus operandi of participation in the health sector, um, it needs to, we need to be looking at the longer term. Um, the second point that I'd like to make here is about political will and decision maker commitment. And this, of course, yes, this does increase the integration of public voice into policies. But uh, one interesting point here, which also has a lot of practical implications, is the fact that when we were in the uh, when we were analyzing the data and working, um, you know, with, with with countries, what we saw is that on the one hand, you need huge political will, of course, to ensure that participatory processes can take place, that they take place repeatedly and that they take place over time, that it really becomes uh, a part of the modus operandi of the sector. So you, you do need that political will out of the highest levels. You know, we're looking at prime ministerial level or at least the very least ministerial level cabinet. So that's important. But at the same time, that's not enough because sometimes that political will is born out of bottom up pressure, um, civil society movements, politics. It might be born out of a revolution like in Tunisia, the Arab Spring Revolution created a lot of pressure from bottom up and you'll be hearing about that after this presentation from 
from Hela Ben Mesmia um, of the Ministry of Health of Tunisia. Um, but then in between, who's actually implementing it? Who's actually doing participation, who's actually um, organizing these participatory spaces, those are really these mid-level technical cadres in the ministries of health and other health institutions. It's director level. It's the people who hold budgets and influence policy content. And if they are not convinced, if they are not, if they're a bit skeptical, or if they might be convinced in terms of the principle, but they don't, don't have the capacity or they've never done something like this before, then, you know, you're going to uh, you know, have some, uh, you know, blockages and obstacles there to really putting in place these participatory mechanisms. So you need that buy-in, not only at the highest political level, but a dual buy-in also from that, those mid-level technical cadres. And I think this is where um, also this is really, um, and, you know, it was a, uh, eye-opening for us, especially as WHO, to say, okay, we need to work at both level, at that political advocacy level, but we need to continue at that technical capacity building level. And finally, I'm not going to go through all these points on the slide because for, for lack of time, I'll just mention one more point and the rest really is, um, you can, uh, you know, please, I invite, invite all of you to look at uh, chapter five in the handbook and the whole handbook, of course, as well for more details. But um, just one point I'd like to make on this issue of the governance versus service delivery approach to participation, which we elaborate upon in more detail in this chapter. And here, and here we don't want to make a dichotomy between the two. These are really very closely related and should be synergistic, but we do distinguish between these two different approaches in the handbook in terms of decision making. So when what we see is that if decision makers, um, you know, approach participation and the participatory process with the primary object objective of improving health service delivery, increasing health facility utilization rates, things like, you know, objectives such as augmenting service coverage, then what we do see is that the principle um, that the interaction with the population tends to be more one way. So then we have an approach to participation where the principal purpose is really about ensuring good governance of the sector. And there, the focus is much more on listening and capturing people's voice to establish a responsive health system. And of course, the two are, are, are very closely linked. They overlap in practice. And what we need is really both in practice. Um, the, you know, and while the two you know, overlap in practice, and it's why it's because when you're capturing people's voice, in the health space, they will be mainly talking about health service availability and quality and service delivery related issues. But the point here is when we're talking about policy uptake, the mindset with which participatory processes are organized by government seems to make a tangible difference with regards to how far people's voice are taken up into policies. And if that mindset is more on, you know, in terms of governance and in, in terms of improving governance, increasing participation for you know, better decision making, then we do see more policy uptake. But as I said, we don't want to make a false dichotomy here. The two approaches are really interlinked and should go hand in hand, especially since many of the participatory governance mechanisms that are set up with the service delivery framing or approach in mind, they can be hugely leveraged for the governance approach as well. So we need to bring the two together and make sure that they synergize. And in the handbook, we have a lot of really nice country examples to really um, illustrate that point a little bit more in detail. Um, next slide. Just to say very briefly, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there are a lot of very, um, format and design elements that play a huge role in, in increasing the probability that the results of a participatory process will get taken up into policies, not the least of which is the issue of selection of representatives and the representation issue, which Kira touched upon, but many others. And, you know, you can find more details in, in the book. Then the next slide. Um, and then another cross-cutting topic that we have across all of the chapters is on capacities and which capacities are needed by the different parties involved, government and people, and uh, there's more detail in the chapter. Next slide. And just to conclude, to say, you know, I think the take-home messages here really are, yes, there is a, a deliberation to policy gap, so while organizing and setting up a participatory space, you need, 
the the issue of how this will be taken up into policy needs to always be kept in mind in terms of the design and the format of the space in order to increase policy uptake and you know sometimes even though it might be the larger goal in the process there might be a few in between goals that need to be addressed first before you get to the point where you really have good policy uptake and there are some key ingredients to ensure policy updates i went through a few of them and there's more in the in the handbook and one of them is also format and design so thank you very much over um and I'll hand over to the country example of Tunisia, where Hela Mesmia will talk about the decision-making space in Tunisia. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Hela Mesmia. I work in the Ministry of Health, and I'm the president of the management unit for the Society in Dialogue for Health Reform. So I'm going today to uh, present the case study for uh, Tunisia, especially um, regarding to uh, the participation process uptake in decision making in health. Uh, next slide, please. So the, pro the process of the societal dialogue for health system reform was launched in 2012 after the revolution. Uh, and uh, it was mainly launched to uh, ensure the right to health uh, as, as recommended by our constitution and to respond to uh, an important question. How could the health system contribute to the realization of uh, the right to health? And the initial concern was the lack of the involvement of the citizens into public decision making and how to shape um, a new reformed health system responding uh, to the needs of the citizens. So uh, the main aim of this process uh, was to involve Tunisian citizens in the development of the national health policy and uh, then in the monitoring and evaluation of its implementation. And within this process, um, it allows uh, and created so different participatory spaces and platform uh, so the citizens and other stakeholders participate in uh, thematic groups, in folks group, especially for uh, vulnerable people, the open mic with the citizens, uh, in regional meetings, we have also met citizens and uh, health professionals, and we have um, the model of, we have used the model of citizen juries, and then in the National Health Conference in the phase two and one, uh, one and two of the process, when we gathered all the stakeholders, governments, parliamentarian, unions, citizens, and civil society. Next slide, please. So uh, th this process uh, has for sure an impact on uh, decision ma making um, in our government. Uh, and the government, especially the Minister of Health, was responsible for uh, the, all the aspects of management uh, and organizing of the events of all the participatory process, and then created uh, spaces and opportunity to listen and to take into account some grievance. Um, but uh, this process of take, uh, taking into account all the feedback of the citizens, especially regarding to the national health policy, uh, is currently uh, ongoing. Uh, before that, I want to uh, mention uh, the main challenges we face it, uh, regarding uh, uptaking uh, this participatory process and decision making was the fluctuation of political interest and uh, the MH responsible responsible's involvement. And we uh, uh, overcome this fluctuation by the av availability of a core group of highly motivated and available experts. Uh, and also we have the commitment of citizens, especially the citizens really that participated in the phase one of the process and also the civil society. But we have spaces, uh, despite of that, uh, how to maintain the citizen interested in time. And uh, we solved that by periodic meetings and uh, communication with them. We have also uh, um, we advocated and we set up governance balance between autonomy of technical work and the involvement of member, uh, members of the, uh, the ministry, other ministries from other sectors. Next slide, please. And now we are uh, thinking to how to go forward. To, I think to uh, um, sustain 
uh, this participatory process and to sustain uh, the participation of the population and all the stakeholders uh, and take into account um, their feedback on decision making. Uh, it will be ensured by the institutionalization of society dialogue as a participatory process uh, that we offer a space for citizens uh, and society to contribute in decision making and uh, it is uh, very linked to the political will. We are currently in the Ministry of Health, um, are developing a uh, draft of health law to analyze the national health policy of the recommendation of this document for uh, 2030. And uh, we are also um, thinking about the most suitable mechanisms to uh, analyze the societal dialogue process in terms of uh, citizens' participation mechanisms uh, in health decision making. Uh, also with uh, the Department of uh, Studies, Health Studies and Planning in the Ministry of Health are currently uh, a stage of uh, elaboration, preparation for uh, an operation plan for the national health policy, with, which is the main product of the phase two of the sites and dialogue. And then it will be the basis to elaborate national development plan 21-25 uh, for all the sectors, uh, the Ministry of Health and all the other departments. Uh, thank you, that's all for me. Thanks, that's uh, terrific, Ella. And um, again, I'm sure we'll have some questions for you in a minute. So we are now turning to our Q&A section. Uh, and to kick things off, uh, I'm actually going to uh, invite Ana Lorena Ruano to make some comments based on uh, what we've heard so far. Ana Lorena is Associate Professor at the Center for International Health at the University of Bergen in Norway, but she's also uh, done a huge amount of work in, in, in Guatemala and is affiliated there with the Center for Health Systems Equity and Governance Studies, uh, particularly around social participation in marginalized communities. So if I could ask you, Ana Lorena, to make some comments on what you've heard today, uh, and then we'll move to a broader Q&A. And again, I remind everyone to please place your questions into the Q&A box on the platform. Ana Lorena, over to you. Thank you very much, Justin. I am very happy to be here discussing the handbook on social participation, both in my role as an academic here at the University of Bergen at the Center for International Health, but also as a practitioner from SEGS in Guatemala. And I think that what all scholars and all practitioners and people in government are always asking is, how do we ensure that there is real representation in participatory processes or in participation processes at the country, at the global level, at the local level? And for me, governments are the ones that have the duty to facilitate and to balance these inequities, but of course this is hard. And civil society also plays a key role in claiming spaces or in rebranding spaces to which they're invited, but where they're not able to participate to the full extent of what they are supposed to do. And I think um, we forget that communities, individuals, academics, practitioners, we all have a right to participate. Social participation is a right. It's a right into itself, and it is also a basic component of many other rights, including the right to health. We forget that without real, true participation, there can be no right to health. Participation is also a pillar of primary health care, something that we see would have done a lot of good if it had been correctly implemented all around the world in health systems, because this was the weak point now during the pandemic. But how do we promote participation? And the handbook tackles this and practitioners and academics, we sort of know, but putting it into practice is difficult because transparent agenda setting is difficult because balancing information and presenting it in a useful way is difficult. And because all of these things lend themselves to a lot of power struggles. And they can also be hijacked or co-opt by more powerful stakeholders and use information and use agenda setting to exclude groups that need to be represented and to participate in policymaking. 
So we need to strive to facilitate and achieve inclusion of more stakeholders. And we can do this through incentives and through planning by incentivizing participation, either through opening up more channels of funding or different scope of policies that can be achieved with a larger variety of stakeholders participating. That is one way to move forward and to plan, to plan for people that live far away, that have other problems besides just coming to a meeting that are not funded by it. How can governments, how can ministries of health, how can local governments facilitate this? The Thai example shows that many stakeholders make for strong policy and for strong implementation. And this is because different stakeholder groups have different powers, uh, power resources and express that power and can use that power in a myriad of ways that can help to facilitate or to hinder policy implementation. What we need is to develop and implement policy through participation. And for that, we need the legitimacy and the voice and the identification of priorities that come from civil society. And we need governments to be there to be present, to be aware, and to handle budgets and to facilitate these processes and to strengthen institutions so that more participation can take place. But participation is also often placed outside of policymaking. And it is this understanding that participation is more than engaging in the policy cycle from the development of policy through to its implementation, its evaluation, and its reformulation. And those types of participation are not what we are looking for to promote. Having people come and hear what your plans are is in participation. And engaging, pe engaging people in real processes where citizens and other civil society groups can lead the discussion of policy, that is the point that we should all aim to achieve. And at the core of this is a weakness that we see in governments all over the world right now. And it's the lack of civic education, either because of chronic defunding of public health system, uh, public health education, public education systems, or because of other issues in, in states, civic education has gone down. And with that, the understanding of participation, both as an obligation and as a right, is lost on new generations, on different cultures. Um, I think that that is all I had in my notes. I'm aware of the time as well. That was terrific and really comprehensive, Ana Lorena. Thank you so much. Um, let's have a little bit of a Q&A now uh, with our panelists. And I'm going to kick it off. Um, and I'll start with our country speakers, Nanut and Hela. Um, and what, what I'd like to know, both of your countries, Thailand uh, and Tunisia, have made you know, a huge amount of progress in terms of uh, social participation and engagement of communities in national dialogues. What advice would you give to countries which are perhaps a little bit earlier in the journey? Nanut, can I ask you first? How do you get started? Thank you. Um, if you just started, you, we can start from the small, not need to do it at the national level, because actually best social participation is on the grassroots level. So I think we better uh, have many social participation platform at uh, sub national levels or even village levels but many platforms, this is one thing. And second thing, as Thailand experienced, we start with help volunteers first. Uh, then these people become uh, empowered. Then we start to establish platforms and laws. So start from the small, walk step by step. That, that's just from me, thank you. So it's really about an incremental approach. Thank you very much, Tanut. Ella, uh, what, what, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, uh, I have. I think I have two two main recommendations. The first one is uh, regarding to uh, the capacity building, both for uh, the government members and also for the civil civil society part. I think uh, we must think of that before uh, going through um, the part social participation uh, engagement process and in the 
step of uh, uh, thinking and the step of uh, development of the, the, the process, we must, must think before that, to empower uh, the government and the civil society to how uh, they participate, how to, to their participation be effectively and for the government, because it's, it's an issue of culture um, as a first step, how to take into account these feedbacks, etc. So this is the first recommendation. Uh, the uh, second recommendation, uh, in um, for the social participation uh, uptake and decision making recommendation, I, I think uh, uh, the issue of institutionalization of this social participation is very important, and we must think also to institutionalize uh, the process, uh, and uh, so it can be uh, an automatic process to um, consult population about health issue, etc. And this is, uh, could be done by setting up um, an adequate uh, legal framework. That's it. Perfect, thank you so much, Ella. Um, I'm glad to see some questions coming through on the Q&A. Thank you, Ariel. Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, uh, Ariel's acknowledging that social and citizen participation are, are critically important for overall democracy and also for the responsiveness of health systems. But uh, a question around what about outside government, country government processes? How do we uh, evaluate the role of international aid funded projects? How do we engage uh, populations in those projects? where sometimes accountability and governance seem to be afterthoughts. I know the focus of this handbook has been on country governments, but what about multilaterals and overseas funded projects? Does anyone want to opine? Anna, Anna Lorena. Thank you. Actually, I am happy that this question popped up because um, I think that meant returning to the idea that I had before, that I was talking about before, where participation is placed outside of governance, and it isn't. It should not be outside of governance. Otherwise, what tends to happen with these large projects that come and use community and use participation is that they engage the poorest and the most excluded of us into extra work. And so I think that a key thing that we must take away from the participation handbook and from participation scholarship in general is that we cannot ask the most excluded and the most marginalized and the most poor to, live, to do even more work, to volunteer even more time. So it is true that these projects bring a lot to communities, but what are we asking them to do? And is that more than we would ask other citizens? And why do we place the most marginalized and the most vulnerable in such precarious positions where they have to volunteer all of their time to get basic things that the rest of us take for granted? Thanks very much. And that actually relates to Ariel's other questions, which is how do we highlight that social participation isn't just a mechanism that, that works like clockwork, but it actually involves huge power inequities. How do we bring to light these power inequities? Uh, Anna Lorena, if you want to continue, go for it. But otherwise, if any of the other panelists would like to come in, please feel free. How do we, how do we tackle power inequities in, in, in social participation? I'm very happy to continue. Please, please keep going. <laughs> please keep going. For me at the core of, I'm a sociologist, so power is at the core of everything. But when it comes to social participation, this is especially true. There are different types of power and we attribute the power that we think is important to these very big stakeholders. And um, for this, I always use an analogy where one time when we got um, daylight savings time in Guatemala one time, and it was done completely from the government. There was no participatory process. There was no information process. There was nothing. The president just announced that the next day we would be moving one hour ahead. This led to the whole country being jet lagged for six months. No one knew what time it was. <laughs> no <laughs> one knew when to meet, <laughs> you know? Then we got a reaction of, of, uh, from the evangelical church where they said, this is not what God intended. And so then we, and some majors decided to not join in their, their municipalities into this. So then we had all these little time zones that were happening. Policy cannot be implemented if we don't use the power that comes from the people. Decision-making power is just as important as implementing power. And that implementing power, we tend to think of it as not valuable until we see how much we lose through it. 
And of course, this implementation power requires a lot more work, a lot more really fine grained nitty gritty stuff for involving civil society, for giving voice to the voiceless, and it makes everything more difficult. But isn't it better to take a little longer to get to a policy that will be accepted instead of having a whole country be jet lagged for six months, <laughs> so to speak? The policy failed. We never went back to the life savings. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent answer. Deepa, do you want to come in there? Yeah, maybe I'll just, just add to that. And I think, um, you know, and this is, you know, to pick up on what Ana, Ana Lorena was saying, you know, the, you know, isn't it better to have a policy that is implementable and is accepted and just take a bit, that little bit more time to include a process of consultation and, and engagement with populations and with communities and civil societies as part of the policy making process. And this is where, um, you know, and this is where we need to build capacities of, of decision makers and policy makers and in order to also build their um, recognition for the value add that this brings into their own work, their own policy making work. Um, and then also build that confidence that this can be done and it's doable. And, you know, and, and I think a lot of policy makers are often apprehensive and afraid of that first phase of of um, of discussion and debate, which can sometimes be in societies where it has never really been done before or it hasn't been done sufficiently and um, in, you know enough, then that first those first few encounters can be very heated, can be very difficult and can be full of recrimination, can be full of um, complaints, can be full of um, you know reproaches towards uh, government and especially they're they're then directed towards these min level cadres who may not even have that the the influencing power to do something about it so there a lot of them are quite afraid of that or are quite apprehensive about that and i think this is where you know we we need to really um boost you know the capacity training and work also with the political level to to be more supportive at a higher level and also to recognize that even though those initial phases might be you know, be be difficult, might be heated, might be full of tension, um, might even seem like that's leading nowhere. It does in the end if we can, if you sort of persist and keep up and get through that phase. And I think both Nanut and Ella are the, the you know, are really, um, you know, the right people to tell you more about this because in practice, this is how it was in both Tunisia and, and Thailand. It wasn't easy at the beginning. It was, you know, you have, you, you need to get over that, um, that initial um, tension and learn how to speak to each other in a way that actually is beneficial to both to all sides and that leads to something that's fruitful, that leads to something that can be taken up by policy and that leads to something that really benefits society in the, in the end. And this, you know, we need to learn it. And as Nanuta said, provide as many platforms as possible, keep practicing participa participation at various levels. And it doesn't always have to be perfect, but just keep, keep at it at the various levels and keep thinking through who's not participating participating and keep thinking through how can we try to recalibrate as far as possible those power relations to make it more meaningful and how you know and and we go into a little bit more granular detail on that especially on that power relation aspect in the handbook um which of course you know i invite all of you to read thank you thanks deeper so i think we have time for one more question and i was actually going to ask you deeper about how we go from the, the the technical work of the handbook to political change in the countries. How do we let this work have teeth? But I see that uh, Evelyn has asked a, a, quite a similar question. What do you do in countries where uh, participation is, is really a tick box exercise and often motivated by fa financial incentives? How do you create a culture of participation where the political goodwill isn't there? So Deepa, I might get you to answer that and perhaps just with a couple of comments about what happens next for the handbook. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, so perhaps we can make that a brief answer and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it to you to conclude the session, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, and thanks Evelyn for that question. So I think this is where political will, real political will is, 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 is necessary at the highest levels. And, and this, is a, this is really uh, an issue in a lot of places. It's a, it's a wall that we, run into ourselves when we're in countries um, trying to really encourage 
member state governments to invest more in participation. Um, you know, and all the arguments that we sometimes get are financial, which is really not a good argument because as you know, even in Thailand, which has a sophisticated National Health Assembly with 90 people at the National Health Commission office to support it, if you look at how much is spent on that every year, vis-a-vis -vis how much is spent on health in general, it's less than, it's, it's you know, 0, 0.0 something percent. I mean, it's a very small percentage of the overall. So it's not a money issue. It's really about political will. And so we would, what, moving forward, post handbook, what we want to do is really work on sort of three streams. We want to, you know, do more political advocacy. So use our cloud as, as WHO, as um, an organization that has good access to the highest level of um, member state um, governments and cabinets to uh, really push for more investment in, in an institutionalization and participatory governance mechanisms as one of the key means towards that noble goal of universal health coverage. And so we, we will be pushing that up a little bit and probably forming something called a, something akin to a social participation leadership type group um, to help us with that. At the same time, we realized that we need to do much more to work with civil society and community groups to really also support some of the bottom up pressure to invest more in participatory governance and social participation mechanisms. So we're going to be working on those two fronts at the same time while continuing on sort of our comfort zone, which is that the third front, which is the technical work, which is, um, you know, supporting countries who are serious about social participation and in, in, in either creating or strengthening mechanisms, you know, the mechanisms that they have, or trying to um, encourage countries where there are windows of opportunities to say, okay, well, you don't have to go straight out and do something like a societal dialogue for health or national health assembly, but you can maybe do a small civil society consultation there. You can go out and speak to communities here as part of this policy and try to use those low hanging fruit to just keep offering and supporting platforms for participation while at the same time ensuring the political advocacy and the civil society engagement. And so with that, we hope that we can get countries to really see the value add to not do this in a tokenistic way and to understand how it really is a win-win for all sides. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Uh, I think that concludes our session. So thank you to our wonderful panelists uh, thank you to everyone who's participated in the development of this handbook and, of course, to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to speaking to you again soon. Farewell. Thank you. Bye, everyone.